Good morning. Welcome to Oakwood Community Church. Uh, we are welcome, or we are glad that you're here. We're welcome that you're here this morning, everybody. Uh, well, today is the day of reckoning. Uh, PD and I had a little bet going that uh, whether Michigan or Michigan State would win, the loser would wear the opposite jersey. Now, I did tell PD this morning, first of all, this is cheating. Second of all... It's, ben, you just know I'm just, I'm just cold. Oh. Just, I'm always cold. You guys cold. know that, right? Now, I, I told PD this morning that the offer is still good to shave his head if Julie gives him permission this no. morning. Oh, I'll just deal with it. Here we go. All right. Can we get a round of applause, please? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> PD, I will officially make the challenge for next year. Already? Already. <laughs> if you want to do it again, we can certainly do it again. We're, we're, we're in a building decade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's the uh, worst part of the whole thing. Well, I'm going to turn it over to PD. He's going to give us an announcement about our wall this morning. Yeah, that's the worst part is that actually has his name on it. When I bought it for him, I thought it was a nice gift. And then I realized, what am I doing? I have to wear not only this, but his name on my back. Well, we had a great, uh, a great offering for the wall this week. And I need a strong back. Anybody is strong that can not get broken? Yes, come up, come up, young man. I need your help. I need your help because I can't do this. Old and decrepit. So... Uh, two weeks in a row, you guys have just been nailing it. Go ahead and come up the stairs on that side. And so we'll remove some blocks here today. And it is 2,600. So take that one, put it in the back there. And then that's the one. So then take that one. And then we'll, uh, we'll take this one. It's like a building project here. There you go. Perfect. And then this 500, there we go, the big one right here. There we go, you're the man. All right, thank the young man for his help. Appreciate it, excellent job. We're getting there, we're getting there. I, I will admit I told Melissa this week, I do regret doing this going into the holidays because I want this thing gone. I want it gone by December because we're gonna decorate for Christmas and it really doesn't match any Christmassy decor. So uh, we'll, we'll keep it going though. We've got what? We got five. We got 10,000, 15, 16, 17, 18. We're under, we're under 20,000. That's great. We've got like 18,000 left. You guys are doing such a good job. We'll keep working on that wall. Get it gone. Uh, I just talked to Melissa today with the payment we'll make, uh, the October payment, then in November, but we're going to be really close. Uh, right now, uh, we will only have to make a partial payment in February uh, to be done. But if we kick that off, it should be done by the first of the year if we can knock that whole thing off. Great job on that. Today is Harvest Festival Day. And so I want to remind you, all hands on deck. And boy, it's, it's going to be great. Did you see the weather? Fantastic. Not supposed to rain till later in the night. Uh, send out social media posts. Look up Oakwood's post. Copy and paste that or share it, however you do it. And then promote the fact that tonight's the better night. Night. I've been, that's how I promoted it. Like, tomorrow's going to stink. Bring your kids to Oakwood on Sunday night. It's going to be great tonight. And we start at, the event starts at 3.30. But if you're on the trunk or treat side, you've got to be here by 2.30. And if those of you who hear that and think, well, I'll come late. No, we shut the parking lot up. We close it off with locks uh, at 3 o'clock. So you can't even get there at, after 3. So 2.30 in the parking lot for trunk or treat to set up your trunk. And then uh, everybody is coming in at 3.30 to watch the Stand Strength Ministries. Those of you worried about your trunks, security, safety, will be patrolling that. They'll be watching it the whole time. It's not gonna be left alone for somebody to wander in and take all of our candy. It'll just leave it there, ready to go. Safety will watch it. Uh, 3.30, we come in here and the Stand Ministries does a half hour presentation. And then we send the volunteers out first to get back in space and ready to go. And then we dismiss the crowd to go to all the events, the trunk or treat, the uh, animal kingdom thing, petting zoo, whatever that's called. We've got a hayride that'll be happening and uh, the donuts and cider. We've got a lot happening here tonight. So we do need regular just volunteers. If you can't do a trunk, uh, we do have some things we need. I specifically need help for the hay maze. We built a beautiful hay maze this year. It's the best we've ever built, uh, but we need people to run it. I haven't heard uh, any volunteers from our student ministries yet. So any volunteers that don't have a job that you're willing to 
scare kids to death, that'd be a great job, okay? Uh, let's see. Go through my checklist of things that have to happen. Uh, if you're doing the trunk or treat, we do suggest that you uh, bring one bag of candy to start, and then we will replenish the candy. You won't run out. Uh, so bring that one bag of candy with you to start, and then the replenisher will have the wheelbarrow, and they'll keep filling your candy so you won't run out of candy. Uh, let's see. If you're parked in the east side of the parking lot, Am I right? Somebody give me that. The east side of the parking lot, if you're parked there today, leave, okay? Do not stay. And don't, don't, go, don't go like to dinner in Frankenmuth and come back at 8 o'clock tonight because I will be so mad. Actually, we were going to pick your car up and move it out to the field if you leave it there. Uh, we need that whole parking lot empty. As soon as we're done today, you guys aren't going to be the problem. It'll be the second service people. Uh, but make sure that's empty. Be on time at 2.30 for the trunk or treat and then bring your one bag of candy. That is all the notes that I had. Uh, looking forward to a great night. Everybody's job, be friendly. <laughs> Everybody's job tonight is welcome people. Let them know. And you might ask, what's the so that? Everybody say so that. Just three weeks ago, we were at family night and we're having our dinner. We have free dinner at 5.30 on Wednesday nights, getting ready for our family night to kick off. The tree house is downstairs. The adults are upstairs. And uh, a, a family comes in. It's grandma and grandpa and about four kids. And they went to the registration desk and they said, are you new? And they said, yes, we are. And they, somebody asked, how did you know about us? We've attended Trunk or Treat in the past. And we thought we would come check this out. So I want to let you know that that is a gateway for people to come and check out Oakwood to see that we love kids, we love families, and it leads to opportunities. So be friendly tonight, be open and encouraging and welcoming to people, and that's going to be a, an awesome night. I think that is it. Why don't, we, uh, why don't you stand with me and we'll pray together over Harvest Festival, and then we'll continue our worship singing. Father God, we do come to you tonight, this morning, asking you for this evening that it would be a great opportunity for Oakwood to shine, that we would just be loving and caring, that uh, Father, the Stan Strength team would have just a wonderful time in their presentation, people would be touched by their message that they have, bless uh, Cheryl and Lindsay and all the athletes as they get ready for tonight's um, presentation. And God, I do pray that families would come. I pray that we would promote it even this afternoon and let people know it's, it's happening and that uh, they have a chance to participate. So Father, we thank you for that. You are good. You are so good and you'll be good uh, no matter if it rains or not rains, God. We do claim that you're a good God and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. We sang this song a couple weeks ago, first time, and I uh, hope you guys are getting to know it. Sing it out if you remember the song. separate your steadfast love who can escape your faithfulness and endless sea so full of grace and mercy we sing God sing it out
smiles on Christ alone. My rock, my shield. singing worship with us this morning. I have two notes, so I'm going to give them to Wendy. Wendy, could you uh, write this down? Galatians 5, 19 through 23, and Colossians 3, 1 through 4. I'm going to need those during my message. Sorry about that. It's Galatians 5, 19 through 23, and Colossians 3, 1 through 4. Busy, busy days working here yesterday, getting Harvest Festival ready, and then early this morning. So, of course, I was up late watching that travesty. So, but I'm so glad that we're here today. 
<laughs> Don't feel so blue. I'm just blue. We've been in this series on Romans for quite a while now, and last week, thank Ben, uh, Pastor Ben was here, and he, he taught Romans 7, and Romans 7 is an interesting passage. It kind of wraps up a thought, and then we get to another one of those therefores. Remember in Romans, the therefores are very important, um, and it, it kind of is a bridge to a next thought, and I'm so happy this morning that our next thought... Uh, our pastor from Battle Creek, Pastor Brian Spencer, he had a word. He had a one-word thing when things were good. Do you remember what it was? Glory. Mm. Glory. He just bellowed when he said it. Glory. When we get to chapter 8 this morning, we all as believers ought to be able to say, Glory. Because there's been a change in the way Paul is talking and what he's talking about this morning. But to end up Romans 7, it actually ends, Romans 7 ended with a rhetorical question. Don't forget, Paul is not just being an author, he's kind of like being a lawyer. And so Paul ends Romans 7 with a rhetorical question. It, he simply asks, who will rescue me from this body subject to death? What a great rhetorical question. He's been talking about sin and the sin nature, and it just leads to death. He's been talking about this new life. Jesus is a hope. But he answers the question emphatically at the beginning of chapter 8 with the only means of rescue. The question is, who can rescue me from this body subject to death? He answers it very clearly. There's only one rescue. There's only one hope. It's Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray this morning. Would you pray this prayer? You don't have to say anything out loud, but I'd ask you to pray this prayer to God. God, since there's something you want me to hear, I'm willing to listen. Just give that prayer to God. God, since there's something you want me to hear, I'm willing to listen. And God, I pray that you'd be glorified. I pray that everyone hearing this would be edified and that Satan would be horrified. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans 8. Meet me there. We're going to do 1 through 13 today. Romans 8, 1 through 13. Either a gadget or there's Bibles in the seats, baskets in front of you or behind you. Romans 8, 1 through 13. All right, you're going to know when to do it. I'm going to look up and you're going to say, glory. A big glory. Not, not, not glory. Not glory. No, it's got to be a deep from the gut, sucking the diaphragm. Glory. Like that. I'll start reading. Romans 8, 1 through 13. Therefore, there is now no condemnation. Glory. Maybe a five, maybe a six. I don't know. You're not ready? Didn't I explain it to us? We're going to do that real guttural. You gotta, I want you to take a breath in when I start to read. And then you're going to give me that glory. All right, you ready? Therefore, there is now no condemnation. Glory. There you go. That's better. There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh. That's an interesting word there, by the way. The word flesh in that context is, is sarx, S-A-R-X, and it's very specifically the sin nature. The nature we're born into, the, 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 the flesh is what we got from Adam sinning and Eve sinning, and now we've been born with that all the way passed down. We're born in the flesh. So what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the sarx, the sin nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh 
cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the Spirit. If, indeed, the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because his Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if the Spirit, but, but if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Glory. <laughs> Amen. There's so much good stuff in this passage. Although I understand sitting there you might think, like any good lawyer, Paul, I mean, you, there's a lot of words there and a lot of flesh, spirit, spirit, flesh, flesh. And, and you might get lost in the haze, right? It's, it's kind of like uh, the fine print and, and at the end of the commercial. I mean, I, I love the, the medical commercials, the, the, the drug commercials, you know, like, you know, uh, this is the best drug of all times. And then at the bottom, it, it might lead to death, diarrhea, you know, I mean, I mean there's, there's like 5,000 little lines there that says, you know, and if you take it, you know, it causes cancer. And it does. I mean, it's just, I mean, all the fine print. We're, we're in the midst of a little bit of fine print here, but it is a fine detail. This is so important. You know, we get this today. It is, a, it is a passage of glory, and yet there's a, there's a contrast so clear, so clear. The first thing, and I, and I picked three words today. I ran it by my wife, and she, she said it was okay. She thought, okay, eh. We were arguing about words this week. So I, I want to boil this down to three main thoughts, right? So I had to pick three words. And, and I actually, I, I gave her one and had her guess the other two. And she couldn't do it because only pastors come up with words that sound alike, right? right? So the big idea today is set free to really live. I don't know if Christians uh, fully grasp what Paul is giving us here that's so wonderful We've been set free, not just from sin, but we've been set free to really, really live. <laughs> In Romans 8, 1 through 13 is the passage. So here's the three essential concepts today. The first one is exoneration. So I know that the first words are there is now no condemnation. Well, I had to come up with a positive for that negative is no condemnation. What's the positive side of not being condemned? It's being exonerated, amen? Amen. <laughs> I mean, the, the thought of this got me excited when I thought about it. You, you've seen over the years somebody who has been guilty and went to prison only to find out later through DNA or whatever, they were not guilty. They come out, then release them from prison, pay them millions of dollars, right? And what do they say? They're exonerated. They were not guilty. They were still cleared of this charge. It's, it's not them. It's not them. And I know you're sitting here going as Christians. Any good Christian would sit there and say, but we are guilty. Yes. But the glory, the glory in this passage that Paul starts it, this therefore with, there is now no condemnation for the believer. You've been exonerated. You're like, but I am guilty. I know I know that's why it's so wonderful. Again, I always point it out, the day of judgment, when I stand before a holy God someday, he's going to want to know who's paying for the sin. And when I say, I ask Jesus Christ, oh, he'd be at the right hand of the guy, throwing the guy. he's over there, and I'm going to point at Jesus and say, I ask Jesus to forgive me of my sin. God then, remember I used the gavel? He slams down that gavel and he says, Don Jackson, you are perfect. He doesn't say, Don Jackson, I'll get over it. You skunk. I'll get over it. No, he doesn't say that. He doesn't say, Don Jackson, man, you barely got in. You really deserve a kick in the pants, but I'm not going to let you in. He doesn't say that. He declares me righteous and pure. <laughs> In other words, I'm exonerated from the sins of my past. 
the sins of my present, the sins yet to come, he exonerates me from that. And you say, how could that be? Well, it's because at the moment of the cross, all of Don Jackson's guilt and sinfulness, Jesus took that on himself. He became sin. He didn't just put it on like the stinky shirt that he had to wear. <laughs> what a great day to wear something like that. He didn't just wear my sin. That's a mistake. No, he became Don Jackson's sin. And he died as Don Jackson's sin. And because of that, my name is cleared. <laughs> wow, I, I don't know. I, 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 mean, I just can't get over that. That's, that's enough right there in one sermon. Those first several words. There is now no condemnation. So there's an exoneration. Exoneration is the act of clearing someone of blame or of an accusation. You see, when I go to, I don't have to be worried about like, like, oh, that one thing's gonna stick. I might get off on some of the other lower offenses, but that one thing is gonna, no, 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 you gotta, you gotta understand this. I'm cleared. I'm totally cleared. It's not that I'm getting away with it. It's that God looks at me and he sees all of the righteousness of Jesus Christ and that's what he sees in me because of what Jesus did for me on the cross. I'm cleared. <laughs> Man, I, I can't get over that. Not only is the penalty gone, you need to understand this, not only is the fear of the penalty gone, but the guilt is removed. That's what this exoneration means. No more penalty, no more guilt. It's all gone. There's now no condemnation. It's not modified condemnation. It's not a less than plea deal. No, there's... There's no condemnation. Jesus paid it all. That's what the hymn says, right? It doesn't say, Jesus paid for the little white lies, but for the big stuff, you'll go down. No, that's not the song. Remember, the song goes, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He Washed it white as snow. Exonerated. I, I, I guess I'm, you're like, you're sounding like Paul now. You keep going on and on. I can't get over this and I can't think that maybe you are understanding it. We're cleared. No guilt. Set free. No penalty. No fear of, of God rejecting me any longer. Propitiation means... God was satisfied with what Jesus did on the cross. It satisfied the justice part of God, God's righteousness and pure. Sin had to be paid for. Christ's death on a cross satisfied God. It's been paid for. It's over. However, <laughs> everybody say however. <laughs> Isn't it just like a lawyer, there's always a caveat, right? And here's the caveat. It's that huge theological word, if. Everybody say if. Right after he talks about it, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's for specific people. See, today, you don't just get exonerated. The judge has to declare you cleared of all charges. The question I have this morning is, are you a believer do you know that you've asked Christ to forgive you of your sin before the judge so that the judge knows that you're cleared of all charges? It's only for the people who are in Christ Jesus. Everybody say in. I was talking to the guys at Barakel last weekend. We had a great weekend with some men here, although the men from our church are a bunch of squirrely dudes. They stole my truck. I came out after chapel one night and my truck is gone. Of course, I know I've got 15 guys from Oakwood. You know who did it, a bunch of squirrely dudes. But I was telling them in chapel these two huge words, in and if, if and in. If anyone is in Christ, you must be redeemed. You must be reborn. You must be regenerated. You must be renewed. Is that you today? That's what we see in the first four verses of Romans chapter eight. Exoneration. Everybody say exoneration. And then we get into something that I, I like here. It's a distinction. Everybody say distinction. 
the longest part of this is, is several paragraphs. It's 5 through 11. And it's where Paul is really the flesh and the spirit, the spirit and the flesh. And he goes back and forth and he keeps talking about that. Distinction is the recognizing or noting of differences. Condition of being different. So now Paul is, he's just said, if you are in Christ, you're exonerated. And now Paul wants to go, how does that life look? Once it's been exonerated, what should that life look like? And he's going to make a very clear point. This is a before and after picture. Before you were in death and guilt, heading for condemnation. That's a before. But then there's an after. How many of you like before and after pictures? I love the before and after pictures. Before and after pictures is what we see in verses 5 through 8. It's like this. I saw this online. I thought, that is so good. Don't you love it when you see the old, old farmhouse and it's kind of been ignored for a while? And then they put in a whole bunch of work and they fixed it. Don't you like before and after pictures? Like this one here. This is a good before. This is when I'm sad. See the sadness? And this will be after church today. Before, then after, right? Before you were one thing and after you'll be another thing. And that's what Paul is trying to get at here. So don't get confused in verses 5 through 11. Specifically in 5 through 8, Paul is simply saying, hey believer, there's a distinction. This is you before and this is now you after. So let's look at that distinction. Before, Paul says, you can look at it in there, but if you, I'm just going to put it on the screen so maybe you'll see it maybe a little clearer in our thought pattern. Before exoneration lives according to the flesh. Remember that sarks, sin nature? We live according to that. It's dominated by desires, right? You all understand that. Um, my dog Jax, he's trained us right from the beginning. He's such a good trainer. He wakes up every night, starting at about one o'clock or so, just to make sure everybody's still okay and everybody's still in the house, and he barks until we come out. And then he wants to go outside and, and pee or bark at the deer. You know, that's another thing he likes to do. I'm having a conversation with Jax right now. Jax, do not bark at the deer. If it's a bear or an elk, bark. Deer, just leave alone. We don't care. Have you ever been like uh, somewhere in the south and, and people stop to look at deer? I'm like, shut up and keep going. There's a thousand million deer out there. We don't care about the deer, right? So Jax wakes us up all the time. One o'clock, 1.30, maybe then 3, 3.30. And, and it's funny, we wake up every morning and Julie will say, I got up with that dog twice. I'm like, really? I got up with him twice too. He's got us up all night long. Drives us nuts. But when I get up, I got to let Jax out the screen door and then I got to wait. What do you think I do in the middle of the night when I'm waiting for Jax? I eat. You wish I prayed. There's my elder. I love my elder. My elder's in the front. He goes, you pray. Praise the Lord. No, I don't. I eat. I eat. I'm sorry. The fridge is calling me. What are you going to do? It's just like late at night, you know, and you haven't eaten since like not too long ago, but you're still, you're, you're like, you're remembering. That's when I remember. I have a great memory at 1.30. I remember that Julie made this pumpkin dessert with a crust on it, and I'm, I'll just eat a bite of that, right? Or, or now there's some, there's some candy in the freezer. I love my Snicker bars frozen and my, my Reese's bar. They're, I love them frozen in the freezer, so I, you know, so if you notice, I've been putting on weight. Blame Jax. It's Jax's fault, right? But that's our body, doesn't it? Isn't that our life? Our body tells us, hey, hey, you want that. See, that's the flesh. The flesh is so good at speaking to us. Hey, hey person who controls this body, I just want to let you know you're hungry. Hey, hey. Brain, this is the stomach speaking. Remind him that there's stuff in the freezer. <gasps> and my brain works with my body. And next thing you know, I'm eating at 1.30, and then at 3.30, and then at 4.30. That's, that's our life. This is our life according to the flesh. It's dominated by desires. It's the mind is governed by the flesh. If your flesh cries out for it, your mind obeys, Right? And then the Bible says, those type of people, the people before exoneration, they are hostile to God. 
I got to point this out. Remember uh, my definition of sin? The definition of sin is I missed the mark. And it's got the connotation of uh, the target. And you, and you, you draw back the bow and the arrow and you let the arrow fly. And the word sin comes from a, a term that means to miss the target. I use that all the time. That's sin. Yet it implies that unsaved people are trying to hit that target. And really what the Bible is saying, sin means I've got my bow and my arrow, but I'm going, I'm, I'm over here, man. It, it, God's target is, I'm not even, not even aiming at God's target. That's what you need to understand. The unsaved person who does not believe in God is not trying to hit the mark. No, they're hostile to God. They do not submit to God and they cannot please God. That is the before picture. What's the result? Over and over again, he says it. If you live in the flesh, the result is death. The body that just answers the call for whatever it desires will lead to death. That's the before picture. Everybody say before. But now let's talk about the after picture. Lives according to the spirit. Everybody say spirit. We no longer live for the sarks. We don't listen to everything the body declares that it wants and needs at any time. We now live by the Spirit. So what does that mean? It defers to the Spirit's desires. So if what God desires and what your flesh desires are in conflict, the Christian defaults to what God desires over what the flesh desires. Why? Because we've been made new. You got to understand, none of this works unless God has made you new, a new mind, a new way of thinking. We used to be default, please the flesh, default, please the flesh. And all of a sudden we ask Christ to save us and forgive us and he rewires our brain so that now we're thinking, what does God want? So we defer to what the spirit desires. The mind is now governed by the spirit instead of the flesh. And so what what kind of results do we have? Remember before we were hostile to God? Now Paul says we have peace with God. Everybody say peace. We, We didn't submit to God before. We could care less before in the flesh. But now all of a sudden we submit to God. When God says no, that's the line. And we don't cross it. It's a new way of living. And we do please God by living in the spirit. That's our new life. What's the result? Life and peace. (laughs) Do you see the contrast there? I mean, I I really love how beautifully it's written. Five through 11 seems like a lot of words, but when you boil it down, it's a before and after picture. Now, let me ask you a question. How does Paul's explanation of pre-saved people and now saved people, how does that fit with the modern theology about mm, carnal Christianity? Have you ever heard, have you ever had, I've heard this, I probably even taught the teaching when I was a youth pastor. There's different types of Christians. There's Christians that are living for Christ. And then there's casual Christians, right? Casual Christians are, they're trying to live a good life, but they're casually going about it. They don't want everybody to know. They're kind of undercover. So we don't tell anybody at work or family. We just kind of believe in Christ privately. Casual Christians. Then there's carnal Christians. Those Christians that are just living in the flesh, living in the flesh. That's their life. But they call themselves Christians. And so they're just carnal Christians. I've heard that my whole life. Honestly, it doesn't square at all with Paul. Paul's like, no, no. No, no, there's a before, and then there's an after. (laughs) There's no, I'm over here, but I'm doing this. No, that that doesn't square at all. And and so I know some of you are like, but I know somebody who claimed to be a Christian, and now they're off the rails. It's not my job to judge. It's not your job to judge. I don't believe a person could lose their salvation. That's why some people come up with a theology. Well, they, they did. They were, but now they lost it, and so now they're unsaved again. I No, that I, I doesn't square with what the Bible teaches. I mean, Jesus, you know, he, he, he wrote my name in the book of life with blood, not with pencil. He's not there erasing it, or he'd have him go through many pencils, right? He'd go through many erasers with me. He, he's out. Ah, okay, he's in. <laughs> oh, he's out. No, that's not how it works, friends. 
Once you're saved, I believe you're always saved, but are you saved? Can we just take a second and really pay attention to all the time that Paul is making it very clear, these two words, if, in. And I don't think you can be in and jump out and jump back in and jump back out. Paul goes as far as to say, no, no, wait a second, what? You were in and now you're out? So you gotta get back in again? Is Jesus gonna die again on the cross? No, he died once for all. He can't die on the cross a second time. Paul is very, very clear. If anyone is in, I don't think people can lose their salvation, but I think there's a lot of people who claim to be saved who aren't. And I don't mean to be judgmental. I'm just saying, when you look at the totality of Scripture and what it teaches, when you surrender your life to Christ, confess your sin, it's more than just a get out of hell free card. It's the beginning of a new life. No, we're not perfect. I'm not saying you have to be perfect. I'm not saying you have to earn it. I'm saying God does a work. He rewires the mind. And then all of a sudden, Paul's introducing a new thing. Did you hear what he introduced now? It's all been about sin and then Jesus. And now all of a sudden, this passage, that's why it's glory. Because this seems awful hard to do. It is. It's impossible. Living by the Spirit over the flesh, you can't do it. Not on your own. That's why all of a sudden Paul's introducing this new thing. Not a new thing, but it's the first time he's introducing it. He's telling us the moment you accept God as your Savior, God does something incredible because you can't do this on your own. You'll default to this, the flesh. So God did this new thing. He unzips you, zip, and he stuffs the Holy Spirit in there and zips it back up. And he goes, you got the Holy Spirit in you. Everywhere you go all the time. What does that Holy Spirit do? He illuminates scriptures so you can understand he also convicts of sin. <laughs> so for the believer, Paul finds it impossible to think that somebody who's truly born again can live in the old flesh constantly. He, he, he doesn't, that's not a concept for him. Why? Because the Holy Spirit wouldn't allow it. The Holy Spirit's gonna say, hey, Christian, that's not good. The way you just talked to your wife, that's not good. The Holy Spirit would just make the believer go, oh, I can't, I gotta, I gotta apologize. The Holy Spirit makes you a new person, a different person. I, I don't wanna tell you who, I don't wanna embarrass the person. I had a conversation with a person this week that was telling me um, that they had to go back into work and apologize to somebody because they said something snippy. And so they were gonna go in and apologize to the person they said something snippy about, but they were gonna apologize to everybody they had said it to. And I'm sitting there thinking, they're gonna think that person's so weird. If they go into work and, and the people, you know, they, they walk in and say, listen, I'm just leave. I, I wanna let you know I said something and it's been bothering me. I feel bad about it, I wanna apologize. I, I made a, and they told me what they said and I'm like, Pfft. and the world's definitely gonna go, Pfft. what? I know it's gonna happen. They're gonna gather around and go, she crazy. She actually apologized for, man, I, I say stuff like that all the time and I could care less, you know? I mean, but that's, that's what I'm getting at this morning because that's what Paul's getting at. Paul is saying there is a distinction, everybody say distinction, between the born again believer and the person who's just living in the flesh. There's a difference. There's a difference. How is it possible? Well, it's God gives me the Holy Spirit in verses nine and 10. He, he really hammers that home. If I'm in Christ and Christ is in me, there's the two sides of that coin there. If I'm in Christ, Christ in me, what does it sound like? It sounds like a relationship. It sounds like abiding, right? Abiding, I'm in Christ, he's in me. Spirit of God is in me. And then Paul says the beautiful thing in verse 11. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. The resurrection power of the Holy Spirit is the same power you have to live a new life. Let me say it again. You need to hear that. The resurrection power that the Spirit has who's living in you is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. It's the same power that'll raise you to new life in Christ. You can't do it by trying harder. You just can't. So Christian, don't, don't think I'm telling you, go home and try, go home and try. No, it's not about trying. It's about being made new and going into training. I'm going into training now. 
Training is different than trying. I've used this illustration many times. How many of you think I can run a full marathon today? Not a one, there's one person who thinks, yeah, but you're a liar. <laughs> I, 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 you know I can't run a marathon today. What is it, 26.2? What is it, is it? 26.2. 26.2 miles? Are you kidding me? I can barely drive that without my leg going numb. Isn't that sad? I can't even drive it or my leg's going to hurt. I got to get out and stretch because my leg's bad. I can't run a marathon. No matter how hard I try, I will not run a marathon. But if, and there's that big but if, but if I would stop eating snacks at 1.30 in the morning, right? I could start there. And then maybe the next day I get up and I walk a mile. And then I walk a mile the next day. And then maybe by the first month, I jog a 5K. I mean, these are, these are bold. These are bold like, wow, could I do that? But you see the difference between trying to run a marathon today versus getting up and starting to train tomorrow? <laughs> There's a difference with a different outcome, right? We don't try to please God and live in the spirit. No, no, he gave us a new life and a new power source, man. It's like, a, what's Iron Man's got that blue thing, you know, that's his power source. You ever, anybody watch movies but me? He's got that blue power source, man. If you take that away, he's, he's done. Guess what, believer? You're not left to your own power. He's given you power for a new life. It's a beautiful thing. He raised Jesus from the dead. He raises me to new life. Last essential component or concept, obligation. Everybody say obligation. obligation. So we've had exoneration, distinction, now obligation. Let me read that part. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Wow, that's beautiful. Obligation, by the way, is something by which a person is bound to do certain things, a binding promise, a sense of duty. Guess what, Christian? You have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God with your bod. Scripture's very clear. You've been given over to a new life, new purpose, new destination, new goals, Holy Spirit-powered, change. There's an obligation. And then this is where people get confused. You're like, but, but PD, you say we don't earn it. No, we're not talking about salvation. Now we're talking about sanctification, walking in the spirit, right? If Christ is in you, you are saved. That's salvation. You didn't earn it. It's a free gift. But at the moment you've accepted that salvation, you are now in an obligation to live a new life. I didn't make up. This word, Paul used it, obligation. Everybody say obligation. And so, our obligation is not to the old flesh. Remember that domination brought death. It's to the new spirit. It's about mortification. Mortification. Remember that word I used a couple weeks ago? Mortification is the term that means putting to death something. It's not masochism, which is pleasure in pain. And it's not asceticism, which means we resent our bodies. No, it's simply conquering the sin issues in our lives. Our minds need rewired. Our walk needs a new direction. The focus of our thought life changes. The focus of our satisfaction changes. This is what happens when you're in Christ. Something new. What are these things that lead us to that? What is this training? PD, you talk about this training. What is this? It's things like fasting. Have you ever taken some time to, to fast? I know right now what intermittent fasting is the new you know, technique. And I'm not talking about trying to lose 10, 15 pounds here. What I'm talking about is a discipline. Everybody say discipline. A discipline of telling your body no. Fasting is something the Bible talks about because it's simply a discipline for us to learn. When our body is saying, hungry, feed me now. Saying, no body, you can wait. You can wait. And while you're waiting, I'm going to rewire the brain by praying. <laughs> I'll be praying. When the stomach's growling, I'll be praying. I'm rewiring my brain here. I'm helping it rethink 
about needs and instant gratification. How about prayer time? It's so hard to just get quiet and stop everything and just pray, isn't it? It's difficult. Let's, let's not pretend. You know and I know that the moment you try to stop and pray, something is, is vying for your attention, right? The phone's buzzing. The phone rings over here. The, uh, you know, you get a text. The kids start fighting. The dog starts pooping. Whatever it is, the world happens around you. And, and we say, I'm going to carve out this time. I'm just going to pray. And then it gets distracted. So what do you got to do? You got to discipline. The Bible talks about going into your closet where there's no distraction to pray. Fasting, praying, worship. Do you make time in your life for just worshiping God, a walk in the woods, praising God for what he's done and what he's made, singing a song. Maybe you remember a song we sang from stage and you're, you're, you're singing it this week, and part of your act of worship. Some of you probably are on the praise team in your own car. That's probably where you perform, right? You hear those songs of blaring and you're singing and you're like, I'm gonna be on, I'm gonna sing with the praise team and you're, you're worshiping. Fasting, prayer, worship. <coughs> Getting into Scripture, maybe even lear learning Scripture. In our experiencing God, we're learning a verse every week. We got them on little cards with little rings on them, and we, we try to learn these verses. I tell people, put those cards up in your visor, and you get to a red light, pull it down and read real quick. Try to learn that verse at the red light, and then when people start honking, it means go. You got to go. But learn the verses. Learn the verses. Scripture. Fellowship. Did you know that fellowship is a discipline? Getting together with other believers? Trust me, because I've seen believers that stop doing that and they're isolated and it's not good for them. To get together with believers is a discipline. I don't want to. I got excuses. I don't, I might not. You know, if we stop fellowship, bad things happen. Fellowship can be a discipline. And then there's serving. Serving is a discipline. I don't want to hand out candy to a bunch of gross kids. <laughs> I, no, I mean, it's not about that. It's serving unto the Lord, the Bible says, right? Yeah, I mean, we're serving because of a greater purpose. Serve, serve. It's a good discipline to humble yourself and to serve. I want to read a couple of verses because I think Galatians 5, we have that there because I want to end with this. Galatians 5, 19 through 23. Here it is in a different passage of Scripture. If you don't get it, here's the comparison again. Remember distinction? Everybody say distinction. The acts of the flesh, sarks, are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, and factions, and envy and drunkenness and orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do you hear Paul saying there's no category called casual Christian. There's no category for a carnal Christian. You can't have it both ways. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve sarks and God at the same time. For you will love the one and hate the other or hate the one and love the other. There's either before or after. And then it goes on to say this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such thing there is no law. There's the contrast again. Two different lives is the Spirit leading you toward love? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. That's the life of a believer. And then uh, give me Colossians 3, 1 through 4. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died <laughs> and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Is that it? The contrasts are there. Paul makes the contrast so very clear. So the conclusion is this. Those who are truly born again are no longer dominated by the desires of the flesh. Instead, they increasingly, that's sanctification, right? 
they increasingly learn to walk in the Spirit and defer to the Spirit's leading. The distinction between the saved and the unsaved is the fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> so what's, what's the evidence coming out of your life? Are you still marked by the life of the flesh? Or has Christ done a new work in you? Are we perfect? No. Man, sometimes the before picture, we started some things that we wish we'd never got into, right? And those things kind of lingered over. And you're still trying to put to death, right? Some of you are practicing this mortification. It's not a one-time thing, is it? It's like, I'm going to put that to death. And then it, it comes back again. And you're like, oh, no, no, no. We're going to put that to death, right? That's real. It's reality. But here's the difference. The true believer is walking in the Spirit, practicing putting to death those things that lead to death. It's a new life and a new direction. Here's the good news as I close in prayer. I'll have the band come up and join me on stage. We're gonna do uh, Build My Life if we could because we're talking about which life are you building. If you're still building the one on flesh, it leads to death. But if you want life and peace, that's how Paul called it, life and peace, then you come to Jesus, accept salvation, but also surrender the life. Build a new life. This is not a message to produce guilt. It's actually a message. The big idea again? What was the big idea? The big idea is I'm set free to really live. If you want to really live, start walking in the Spirit and put to death the things that are gone. It's the old life. Put them to death. Let's sing that song, Build, build My Life, as a closing song. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you would help us as believers. Help us with this new life. It's, it's challenging. Help us not to satisfy or, or be content with this kind of half in, half out. But God, make us new. See you back here this afternoon for Harvest Festival. Have a good day.